Welcome back everybody. Another video with another wacky firearm from the Royal Armouries collection. This one's quite wacky, but it does have a very obvious superficial resemblance to something that's decidedly unwacky. The Thompson submachine gun. Let's get that one out of the way. This is definitely not a Thompson submachine gun. The general layout, I would say, maybe a bit of trigger mechanism and maybe a bit of the bolt. <laughs> but it, it's really, I'd, I'd say Thompson inspired is fair to say. So this was invented in, uh, produced in 1932, we believe. Uh, designed and made, we also believe, by Mark Dinley. Now, this is a significant name in the world of arms and armour. Uh, Mark Dinley was a, a noted collector of, well, I believe every, from all eras actually, m much like ourselves. Uh, so he had a sizable collection. He was also involved uh, working with governments. Yeah, quite quite a quite a big sort of mover and shaker. And he's actually part of this strong British tradition of uh, blokes in sheds designing firearms. Um, you know, p p people talk about Accuracy International today. Started out as two men in a shed. It's basically the case, and is now a you know, major, major player, major company making some very good precision rifles. Uh, the big difference here is that Mark Dinley's shed was a mansion uh, because he was rather well off. This is how he was able to amass um, a sizable collection. He also uh, founded the uh, movie armourer company, Bapti & Co, uh, with a major Bapti uh, in 1919, I believe that was. So he's yeah, quite a, a staple feature of the, the UK firearms scene, shall we say. And he did try his hand with designing and producing certainly this thing. Uh, incidentally, his, his mansion was uh, the Priory, uh, at a place called Berwick St. John. I've never been, I've not even seen a picture, but um, I have heard a few stories about um, some of the interesting things that he had there. Now, uh, the Dinley collection was um, semi-donated, semi-loaned, the, the two, two chunks of it to the Ministry of Defence pattern room, and that's where we ended up with several dozen uh, important firearms from that collection. You can always spot them, because they have uh, Dinley's monogram, which we'll try to show you. It's, on, it's stamped on every major part. I think he was quite worried about theft. Probably the most obvious on this piece is on top of the receiver, but it's also on the woodwork. And it is an MD. Um, overlay in an oval. Now I think it's slightly unfortunate that he did that with all of his his um, historic firearms because of course that's altering uh, their originality but to us these days 100 years later that's now part of its history as well to be honest. But the purist <laughs> collector would probably flinch slightly to, at having a, a 20th century guy's name branded all over 19th century firearms for example but couldn't be more apt in this case because it's his gun that he designed and, and either he made on site or he had a gun maker make for him. That is a bit unclear, I will say. So we need to look at that, this in a bit of detail to see uh, all the ways in which it's not a Thompson, <laughs> primarily. Firstly, scale. Um, I mean, hopefully you've seen enough of me by this point <laughs> to realise roughly <laughs> what size I am, how big my hands are. This is a tiny gun. This is like a... Uh, not, not quite a, a gun for ants in a, in a oblique Zoolander reference, but, <laughs> but it's very much, this is almost a child-sized Thompson gun, which might, that might sound silly, silly to say, and it is, in that there are no child-sized Thompson guns that I'm aware of, but there is a tradition in firearms history of guns sized for children, and I, if you told me this, this was designed for a child and made for a child, I would probably have believed you. All of the proportions are reduced. Overall length, though, is still fairly substantial. Uh, making it this small doesn't really make it too much more compact than, say, a Sten. Um, the, so the ways in which it does resemble a Thompson, we have the dropped butt, wooden buttstock, and it even removes, like the 1921 original Thompson, push of a button, and off it slides. It's got obviously the twin 
wooden pistol grips. It's got a finned barrel like the early Thompson. Um, it does have uh, two cuts in the barrel to act as, as something of a compensator, but really it's nothing like the cuts compensator for the Thompson at all. The big blocky receiver is definitely reminiscent. And the grip frame is somewhat Thompson-esque, I suppose. Uh, inside the, the trigger mechanism with the um, interacting sears is somewhat like the Thompson as well. Uh, I dare say, I'd go so far as to say inspired by. But, you know, that's kind of where the similarities end, with one exception, which is the bolt, which I'll show you. But then the design of that is not unique to the, to the Thompson either. So before we do um, sort of field strip this thing, at least, no other notable features. Well, the sights, I mean, you've got this. Now, this is a little bit similar to, to the Lewis, not the, not the Lewis machine gun, but the Lewis pattern of, of British rifle sight, and also some French uh, military sights where there's a big block that also has a groove in it. So if you want detail, like fine aiming, you can use the little groove. If you want generic, uh, like general, more general aiming, you can pick up the block that the groove is cut into, if that makes sense. That's already quite um, an, an advanced sight for a submachine gun. I'm not quite sure why I didn't just go for a blade, but there we are. But then it really goes crazy with the rear sight. This is a, a really very complex micrometer style adjustment. It's adjustable for windage and elevation, and it's completely original fabrication. Um, this is not, you know, this has not been dropped on from an from a existing rear sight design, which is actually quite surprising. It's almost like uh, Diley wanted to do everything from scratch, taking a couple of inspiration, but going his own way. Fair enough. Uh, there's a big old barrel nut here. Again, we won't unscrew that, but the barrel is retained by that nut, but also this screw. It, it is all a little bit make, do and mend, but the overall finish, as you can see, is nice, quite nicely blued, quite nicely, uh, it's quite nice flat square surfaces and all of that. Uh, the sl sling swivel on the side there, and another one uh, with the grip. Now the grip has a sort of outrigger here, again somewhat reminiscent of the Thompson. So I keep talking myself out of this nothing, being nothing like a Thompson, because there are quite a few parallels. Uh, the cocking handle, unfortunately, um, almost certainly was some sort of wooden affair with this screw supporting it. That's, that's long gone, and we don't know what that looked like, so we just have this well, it's more of a bolt really than a screw, attached to a flange that's part of the bolt carrier. Got an ejection port here. Uh, we've actually got markings. Uh, now, intriguingly, now the reason, the reason we know this was uh, made in 1932 is it says 1932 on it. So right below that Dinely marking, it says 1932. And below that, we have number 502. I would be astonished if there are 501 others of these anywhere else. <laughs> well, that, uh, if you did start at 500, then maybe this is the second one of two that were ever made. Don't know. There's a lot we don't know about this. Perhaps the final thing before I put you out of your misery and take out the, uh, the bolt for you, the selector. So this is, a de uh, this is definitely a departure from the Thompson. We don't have a separate rotating um, safety and a separate uh, fire selector we have a single rotary uh, checkered sort of lever with a checkered button on it rather there's a bizarre little detent here that you have to force the uh, selector past to put it on safe don't get that at all I, mean, I suppose it's better than having it work the other way where you're desperately trying to jam your selector onto fire while the enemy is attacking you. But still, I don't see why that's desirable. If anyone can see why you'd want to, to do that. I mean, other than the obvious of accidentally putting it on safe. But if the selector can accidentally be put on safe, I'd argue it's probably not a great design in the first place. And we have an S marking for safe. We have an F marking, presumably, for fire. And then we have an FA, and the F has been double overstamped. Just a mistake. And FA... Again, in an oblique reference to the Thompson, is probably full auto. I do have to note the lack of a magazine. We just don't have one. We don't know what they look like. Even the magazine well is 
I don't know. I mean, I've tried to look at, at contemporary pistol designs to see if it, he'd adapted this to a pistol magazine because the way the magazine catch works is like it could easily be a 32 for this is 32 ACP pistol magazine design of some type, but I've yet to find one. An awful lot of pistols in those days were heel release. Uh, this is a button release design. Uh, it could have been a heel release mag adapted to this cap. We just don't know. So unfortunately, we are missing um, the mag, but it must have been a straight little dinky box magazine for 32. Okay, now the, the disassembly, or as, as far as as far disassembled as I'm going to take it today, actually gives us one more marking to look at. So we have this sliding catch here, which you have to hold to the rear, which I'll do in a minute. And it's marked C and O. Now my guess is that's closed and open. <laughs> so to achieve that, you have to pull back so the catch is in the open position, and this is going to be very awkward to pull off. Pull back and twist. Now it will it will stop there because you have a little plunger. You can probably see the plunger that actually keeps it shut. So we have to keep pulling back on that into the open position, and we don't want to mar the finish on the gun as well. So we keep holding that down, a little bit like the muzzle device on a, an AKM and then we can unscrew it the rest of the way. And that gives us our rather diminutive recoil spring, but this is in a small caliber. And our end cap, so there's a, the spigot guide rod effectively for the spring is, is well, it's not obviously um, part of this component, this, this is an assembly, but uh, that's permanently attached in there now. There's our little peg that keeps the gun shut. It's serviceable, I suppose, but um, there's probably a reason why nobody else has used this system. And this end cap is weighty enough that in a pinch you could probably throw it at the enemy and do them some, some harm. That means we can then withdraw the bolt group and that is unfortunately as far as we're going to take this today. But that's not quite it because it does have a two piece firing pin part of the bolt and a front other part of the bolt. <laughs> and there's that flange that the uh, cocking handle is attached to. It is a little bit reminiscent of the earlier Thompson and I, well, other designs as well. I mean, a lot of early submachine guns, early ish submachine guns, did have a two part bolt that works in this way. Now this is not a, this isn't a closed bolt, fire the gun with the rear path bolt system, it's just a two part bolt. So once it's assembled in the gun, those two stay together, the firing pin stays sticking out the front. Uh, and this is why with the later Thompson, with the M1A1, they were able to just make that a fixed firing pin, more like a Sten and you know, ease production. But it does have that sort of rod like front profile, a little bit like a Tommy gun, classic extractor, the ejector is um, rudimentary and is this large screw here. So there's a, there's a funny little keeper screw you have to undo and then you undo the main screw and on the other side of that big flat screw is a little blade, almost looks like a screwdriver blade. We probably can't show it to you in situ. And that's the ejector. So as with most, most systems, the little claw extractor yanks out the case and then in this little groove along the side runs the blade and the blade kicks it out of the gun. And that's really all there is to it. Uh, it's very heavy for what it is. Um, it is small. It would be very controllable. Um, you know, a Scorpion in um, 32 is, is, is very, very controllable and is a lot lighter than this. So it would have that going for it. Um, I guess if the sights were set up right, it would be relatively accurate for single shots. We do know that the, well, well we can assume that the intent, despite the small caliber, was to equip the British military because the Small Arms Committee did receive one or more guns and did test them. But this was on a sort of test and evaluation basis. Like most of these 
trials that you read about um, for wacky stuff are, you know, the, dining was a known, a known uh, quantity and someone that was um, involved in government, so um, why not see what he's up to and see if it's any good, basically. And unfortunately, they did not see a, a role for this or they had some other issues with it. I'd like to dig out and dig more into this if I can. Um, now, Dinely's firm, Dinely and Dowding, was, it was an engineering firm, so presumably they really did make this, uh, but they also imported firearms. So this having failed, in 1938, Dinely did also offer to the War Office the BSA Kirali, it's a 9mm, 9 parabellum submachine gun design. So you know, if, you can't, if we can't make our own submachine gun, maybe we can be the importer, or, or, or rather the, the agent, if you like, for um, this design. That uh, lost out uh, in the long term to the Lanchester, the Royal Navy purchased a, a number of, which in turn lost out to the Sten gun and also the Thompson. <laughs> um, so, well, at least for, for several years, you know, the British Thompson was, was a feature of the, the inventory, uh, the commandos, the home guard. So in a, in a roundabout way, this kind of Thompson lookalike ultimately lost out to the actual Thompson that was invented some years before it. You can look at it that way. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that one. Um, there are ways that you can support us, but by far what we would appreciate the most, uh, well, two things, really. Firstly, um, like and subscribe and all that YouTube stuff. But secondly, we do have three museums that are, if you're in the UK, um, now or in the future, you should definitely come and visit. If you are in the UK this summer, we have a series of Elizabethan-themed events going on, horse shows in particular, and that culminates in an Elizabethan version of the joust, um, actual jousting uh, with lances, which is something that we are known for and is well worth checking out if you never have. Um, not many places you can do that. Um, also, you can check out our various social media outlets um, through the website. So we really appreciate you. Catch you again next time.